The world is heating up, and while this might seem like a reason to buy some sunglasses and a pina colada, the implications are pretty scary. With rising sea levels, falling crop yields, and more extreme weather in summer and winter, experts insist something needs to be done to slow down these changes. Scientists all over the world are sweating in the rising heat to try to find a solution to our possible impending doom, and recent findings suggest that our saviors may be bigger and furrier than you might think. Changes are happening around the world that hint at the scary events our future holds as our climate changes. All over Siberia, Antarctica, and other regions of the Northern Hemisphere, huge craters and lakes are appearing seemingly out of nowhere. In these same regions, whole forests of trees can be found leaning over precariously, as if they've had one too many at the local ice bar. This phenomenon, known as drunken trees, looks like the aftermath of a nuclear explosion or a woolly mammoth on a rampage. But this isn't the case, at least not yet. In chilly regions like these, the sudden appearance of rivers and streams have brought flooding to previously safe locations. City buildings in Siberia and other northern zones have been brought to collapse, and the Doomsday Vault, a place designed to keep a reserve of our planet's seeds in case of a global disaster, built in a mountain on the Norwegian island of Spitsbergen, suffered unanticipated flooding last year, threatening our future post-apocalyptic reserves. Recently, a remote, icy Siberian village was plagued with an inexplicable breakout of anthrax, which devastated the population. These anomalies aren't the result of meteor showers from space. The problem comes from within the Earth itself. All of these terrifying incidents share the same cause, a thing called permafrost, and the fact that it's melting. Permafrost doesn't refer to the feeling of a loveless marriage, it's even more horrible than that. Permafrost, which is thawing out at alarming rates, presents us with one of the biggest problems we've ever faced as a species, and we are making it worse. Permafrost can be found in 24% of exposed land in the Northern Hemisphere, but what is it? An area made up of soil, sediment, rock, or ice is said to be in a state of permafrost after being frozen for more than two years straight. Much of the permafrost on Earth has been in that state for tens of thousands of years, meaning it harbors a huge amount of organic material from the past. The anthrax outbreak in Siberia I mentioned earlier came from within the permafrost. As it thawed, so did the preserved carcass of a reindeer, along with the anthrax causing Bacillus anthracis it carried. But ancient frozen diseases aren't even the worst of it. When permafrost thaws, any ice within it melts away, leaving cavernous gaps in the soil. These gaps cave in over time, warping roads to cartoonish proportions, collapsing homes, and leaving craters in the ground. Some of these craters have been recorded as large as half a mile wide and almost 300 feet deep and counting as the collapse continues. But the problem gets even scarier at the molecular level. When permafrost thaws, the organic life preserved within for millennia defrosts, and like leaving the refrigerator open, the stuff inside begins to rot. As microbes feast on the organic material, they give off carbon dioxide and methane gas, two of the most potent greenhouse gases in the world. These gases are released into the atmosphere or are trapped in the soil. Neither option is good for us, because carbon dioxide and methane are exceptionally good at trapping heat, hence the term greenhouse gas. Whether they are up above or down below, they contribute substantially to a warming of the Earth. And so, as this warming occurs, more permafrost melts, sea levels rise, crop yields fall, and we're caught in a very real and very worried cycle. To make matters worse, the collective outputs from our industries are rapidly speeding this process up. As we continue to pump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the impact could be so drastic that, if we don't change our methods, 70% of Earth's permafrost could be thawed by 2100, potentially releasing 120 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. This is expected to cause sea levels to rise by at least 6 meters globally. If we can substantially reduce our production of greenhouse gases, we can reduce the thawing of the ice to 30% in the same time frame. To put this into perspective, widespread thawing of this kind would, on estimate, release twice the entire current atmospheric store of carbon. To help you get a sense of how vast the reserves are, 70% of the entire landmass of Russia is permafrost. Pretty crazy, huh? And to witness the power trapped in these reserves, just look at all the exploding frozen lakes. Yeah, that's a thing. Some of the permafrost frozen lakes in Alaska have bubbles of methane trapped under the surface that explode if a flame is near when they are released. Awesome to watch, but a reminder of how incredibly powerful the stuff trapped in the ice is. The threat lurking in Earth's frozen ground will become very real the next 100 years. In a feedback loop that feels like a spiral staircase down into Hell's Inferno, thawing permafrost is expected to be both a contributing factor and a product of an average temperature rise of up to 7 degrees Fahrenheit by 2100, as calculated in an extensive study carried out by the NHTSA in 2017. As you can see on Parag Khanna's famously alarming heat map forecast, 
A temperature rise of this amount could leave the areas in yellow, including much of the southern USA, as uninhabitable desert, while regions in brown and red, coastal and riverside cities like London, England included, would be devastated by rising sea levels. According to a 2009 study by the NCEAS, even a 10% permafrost thaw could result in a 1.25 degree Fahrenheit global temperature rise by the end of the 21st century. The reality is we're heading into something far more drastic at an expected 70% and above. Okay, so clearly we we have a problem, but what can we do? Well, for starters, we could cut down on the fossil fuels. But people have been saying this for a while, and it's taking a little too long to stick. Plus, it's very difficult to enforce on those unwilling to play ball. So we need to look at other options too, and this is where it gets even crazier. You see, permafrost thaws a lot faster in regions with thick canopies of trees and shrubbery. The flora traps heat really effectively, transferring warmth into the soil and raising the ground temperature. The ice in the soil melts, leaving gaps. This is what causes those drunken trees I mentioned earlier, as their roots become loose with nothing to grip underground. They hadn't just forgotten to attend their AA meetings. In areas of Siberia, Alaska, and other frozen regions, there are vast stretches of land dominated by trees like the black spruce, which is particularly effective at trapping heat. These stretches of land are where permafrost thaws the most, but it wasn't always like this. In past ice ages like the Pleistocene era, large mammals of the land kept these areas in check, feasting on the plant life and knocking down trees. During these periods, large animals, collectively known as megafauna, were so prolific that the areas were transformed into vast open grasslands instead of forests, which kept the ground much cooler. Megafauna species' vast numbers allowed them to consume plant life in such quantities, spreading uh, fertilizer as they went that they left little but grass in their way. Environmental scientists stress that we need to recreate these conditions. If we do so, we can partially slow the thawing permafrost caused by our industrial greenhouse gases. To do this manually, digging up forests with machinery, would be incredibly labor-intensive and extremely expensive. So, as is the case with many solutions to the problems of our modern world, we are looking to nature for our answers. Efforts from pioneers like geophysicist Sergei Zimov have begun exploring these natural methods. Zimov officially established Pleistocene Park in 1996, an area of six square square miles in northeastern Siberia, which Zimov's teams have been slowly filling with megafauna from around the world, like domesticated yaks and European bison. The project has already enjoyed success, with patches of the area returning to a grassland state. But this solution has its limits. With the limited range of animals on Earth who are adapted to survive in the cold of Siberia and other harsh northern climates, Zimov proclaims that we will only be able to cover around 65% of the necessary area using these methods. For full coverage, we would need to go bigger. But what's bigger than bison? Gray? flappy-eared giants, elephants. In their natural habitats like the savannas of Africa and Asian jungles, elephants leave distinct marks of their presence. They trample plant life, rip trees from the ground with their powerful trunks, and crush soil underneath their heavy feet. Earth's wildlife doesn't get much bigger than elephants, but on top of their limited global numbers, modern Asian and African elephants wouldn't last a day in the freezing cold of the tundra. However, the elephants we know and love happen to have a distant cousin who used to make the tundra their home, and the chance of these ancestral beasts making a comeback is surprisingly high. If you haven't guessed yet, I'm talking about woolly mammoths. These furry giants who reached over 11 feet in height went extinct as recently as five and a half thousand years ago. They had shorter tails and much smaller ears than their modern day counterparts, as well as thick fur which adapted them to cold climates like Siberia, where they thrived alongside woolly rhinos and wild horses. Amazingly, scientists have been able to retrieve incredibly well-preserved specimens of each of these species from Siberian permafrost, which has kept them in good condition for up to 20,000 years in some cases. The specimens are so well preserved that they still contain actual fur and red muscle from the mammoths, and top scientists in Japan have asserted that, using cutting-edge techniques, we may be able to bring them back to life in the next few years. While cloning the mammoths directly is nearly impossible without a good sample of reproductive cells, scientists are working with the latest genetic modification technologies like CRISPR-Cas9, which uses DNA sequencing to identify and isolate the genetic traits that made mammoths such resilient survivors of the cold. These traits can then be integrated into the DNA of modern Asian elephants, their closest living relatives, to create something new, a mammophant, if you will. Unfortunately, the ivory industry has completely devastated the population of elephants worldwide, which is another incentive for creating a new hybrid creature, as it could contribute to an eventual repopulation of the elephant species on Earth. Due to the limited number of Asian elephants in the world, the risk of gestating a mammophant in the womb of a female Asian elephant is too high. So scientists are currently focusing on growing mammals in artificial wombs. Beginning their practices on mice, researchers are attempting to develop mouse embryos ex vitro 
Ito, outside of a mother in an artificial womb, with some success. This is proving understandably difficult, which is delaying the process of bringing the mammoths back. But researchers remain optimistic. If successful, we could see the introduction of an extinct species for the first time in human history. Researchers have received some backlash from those concerned about the ecological and ethical risks involved in playing God with nature, but these arguments are countered by those who share the outlook of Sergei Zimov, the man behind Pleistocene Park, who suggests that the regenerative potential awaiting in the Siberian tundra is too good to waste. Does the fact that humans are directly responsible for accelerating the thaw of permafrost give us a responsibility to reduce the damage? If woolly mammoths and other fauna from the same era were able to make an eventual return, the results could be staggering. Sergei Zimov estimates that the reintroduction of an elephantine species to the Siberian tundra would allow for 95% of the usable land to revert back to a grassland state. Slowing the thaw of permafrost on this scale would be hugely beneficial in slowing the production of those harmful greenhouse gases and would ensure that the risk to human life from environmental dangers is minimal. To restore the unoccupied northern ranges of Russia and Europe to the glory of 12,000 years ago, when the area was a single colossal biome paleontologists called the Mammoth Steppe, filled with incredible creatures who served as convenient furry lawnmowers could quite literally save the world, or at least delay its destruction. Project Drawdown, a comprehensive project to control the effects of climate change led by Paul Hawken, listed the repopulation of the Mammoth Steppe in Siberia as one of the top 100 options available to us for mitigating the effects of climate change. Who better for the job than the former steppe king, the woolly mammoth? The idea is becoming more and more viable with each passing year, and now something that sounds like a scene from the next Jurassic Park movie could actually be coming to life. So, does the thought of bringing back long extinct animals freak you out? Do you like the idea of meeting a mammoth in Russia's icy tundra? Let me know in the comment section down below, and thanks for watching.